So we know each other, Amber, from the bereavement world. We've worked on projects together, but we've never had a kind of therapeutic, sort of intimate conversation about the death of your mum. Mm. And so now is our now's our time. first time. <laughs> it's so interesting, and obviously, when you asked me to come on, it that was my initial thought of we have we've had. I've been I felt so honored to be able to work with you throughout you know the last couple of years and um build like a friendship with you but actually yeah. I feel like there has been there's been times that I know you will tap into something for me that I feel no other like friendship or relationship that I've built with in the space can tap into and probably I you know I want you on my podcast, and I know there's something that's going. Are you ready for Julia to come on the podcast? <laughs> but I'm really, really grateful and excited to be here today and see what comes of our conversation. Yeah. So shall we? Shall we start at the beginning in kind of telling our listeners what is the challenge you've been facing and had to overcome? So, yeah, my mum passed away in 2016 to a very sudden heart attack. I was 19 at the time and had no previous experience of like a very immediate bereavement. My dad's mother passed away about a month before um, my mum, but she lives in the Caribbean and I, I met her once. So that was kind of my own real first taste of bereavement, but my losing my mum and the death of my mum was the first real up close bereavement that absolutely shook the table for me and being 19 um you know you're at a very age where you're quite impressionable and quite you're just figuring out who the hell you want to be and I felt like I had a really strong and clear trajectory of where I wanted to go and then losing my mum just put an absolute bomb in it. And I thought, I have no idea who I am or what I want to be. And fast forwarding three years, I just kept my head down. I say kept my head down, but kept my head down like a fiery raging bull and just bulldozed through every relationship in my life and just self-sabotaged and imploded. And until summer of 2019, when I said enough was enough and when my mental health kind of said, you need to do something before something quite bad happens because you haven't dealt really with the loss of your mum. So, I mean, what I, I can really understand that in that the speed of her death at such a transitional age, it's like a kind of tipping point. I mean, at 19, you were by no means an adult, although legally one. You were just figuring out, you know, developmentally how I'm going to be as an adult, where you can separate from your mum, where you can step back and sort of choose which bits of what she believes or how she was you could incorporate and which you could really th say that's her and that's not me. But with her dying so traumatically and suddenly, all of that stops, doesn't it? Your capacity to do anything transitional or psychological is utterly splintered. And it sounds like you the rage of grief, which isn't fully acknowledged, I don't think, because we don't like anger. Anger isn't very popular. We we can deal with sadness a bit. <laughs> yeah. But the kind of what you're describing of that kind of earthquake of feelings that was going on inside was blowing up your life, actually, because yeah. you weren't dealing with them and allowing them. Totally. I, I, do you know what, Julie, as well? I feel like in only in the last couple of years since I started Grief Gang and started to understand my own grief better through conversation and other people's losses and, and talking to them through the podcast is understanding that I didn't like purposefully choose to be angry all every single day of my life. 
it was just that being angry was like the most familiar feeling to me and the most comfortable and that actually saying to these people close to me who I wanted to support me instead of saying I really need you and I am so heartbroken at this loss of my mum and I don't know how to go on every single day it was easier to say expletive sorry fuck you and get out of my life just to push push and push I couldn't I couldn't let that wall down but and I didn't really understand the magnitude or how deep this grief ran through me um I just thought this is must be quite normal everybody must feel this like rage like every day of their life and when I realized actually this the rage wasn't just I was just this I, I really kind of named myself as just this really angry person who was quite flipped you know quite quick to fly off the chain and actually I'm not like now it's really I look back at that time of my life and I think gosh I am far very far from that girl and anger is now it is quite a scary feeling to me to really get to that state of anger again you have to get me there a lot really tick my buttons a lot to get me there now um but I, I can now give that younger version of Amber quite a lot of grace. I can give her quite a lot of grace. I used to give her quite a hard time and say, oh, you were just a bitch. You were like, you were nasty. And I was nasty to people. I was nasty to myself. And I really used to give myself a hard time of, you were, you did some bad things, Amber. And now I can, I can hold myself accountable and I can give myself grace. But that's taken a lot of time, <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> I really like that kind of, recognition and the word grace you know that anger is a really vital protection in a way and in kind of psych speaker defense because if you hadn't felt angry I think you would have been frightened that you'd completely fall apart so at least anger gave you a sense of power to yeah. sort of charge through but also as you're talking you know, I'm aware there are probably lots of different parts of you and there's that still that 19-year-old bereaved young person in you who is mm. angry and then there's there's the kind of wise version of you who's learned a lot from the Grief Gang pod. So I'm really kind of touched by your awareness of how you can give yourself grace for that kind of raging young person and recognition that it was all that you had in your tank because if you weren't really angry you probably would have been scared that you'd completely fall apart mm. and I'm also aware that there are lots of different parts of you and that there's still that young 19 year old Amber mm. and I wonder as you're kind of looking at yourself now having learned so much what she would say do you know what as well recently i've been reading obviously as you know the wonderful cariad lloyd you are not alone and there's a chapter in there a, a segment when she talks about teenage grief club and how she herself very much undermined the age that she lost her father and kind of said oh well it would be no different if i lost my father at 25 or 32 but that actually losing uh, her father at 15 and me and my mum at 19 is a very big deal and that it's a it's a very huge factor and I definitely grieve for 19 year old Amber like the last year of my teenage life was just I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you what that last, 19, that last 19th year of my life was. It was such a blur, that first year of grief. And how she had to grow up so quickly. Um, and I speak a lot about how I was given these almost new goggles of life. And I, they were just stuck to my face. And no matter how much I wanted to peel them off, and still see the world as my peers at 19, quite carefree and frivolous, I couldn't. I was trying to pull these goggles off, but I could now see the world and kind of, and the fragility of life for what it was, of knowing someone you love can be here one day and be dropped down dead the next. Um, and I used to fritter between 
oh, that's really quite, I don't know, empowering of go out and live your fucking life. And then also, oh my God, someone can you love can die tomorrow and give me that anxiety. And I'd never really suffered with anxiety around that. But 19 year old Amber like I just think about her often I just think if I could go back to her and just say and like tell her one thing I, I, I often do always go back to don't be so angry at the world like just don't be so angry at the world and everybody that is in it um you it is you are drinking the poison and wanting everybody else to die um it you're 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 like you're literally yeah. self-sabotaging on the highest level and you're the one who is coming out most miserable what the fuck are you doing let's put something in place and so i would definitely yeah, give a bit of tough love and what does she <laughs> say though oh she would tell me to fuck off probably <laughs> so what does she, she would in telling you to fuck off she's saying what though like you don't get it <laughs> Yeah, she's, I honestly did walk around and I was meet, I was meeting some people who had walked the same, you know, kind of path of grief and they would tell me, you know, you, it won't always feel like this. And I wanted to just tell them to get out, get away from me. Like, how on earth can you ever say that? It seemed impossible that I could ever get to a stage where her anniversary wouldn't be quite as painful or that we could actually have a celebration on her birthday and Christmases will actually feel joyous again. Um, all of that, I just thought, you're deluded. And actually, guiltily, I definitely did presume that people who said that didn't actually really love their people. And I know that's really problematic to say, but now I'm at a stage where I these days are... I don't want to say easier, but they're softer to me. And I can find and I can acknowledge the grief and the sad. Yeah, I can acknowledge the grief and the sadness all at once and the joy. And I love my mum just as much as before. She, you know, I love her, if not more. So that that the, the thing, thing, feeling of that, I used to thought, think that people who would say, it won't always feel that bad or it will get, you know, you'll carry it with you always, but, you know, some days will be better. I was thinking, oh, well, you didn't clearly love your person like I love my mum. And it's just like, oh, gosh, hindsight, what an incredible thing. And also, I think there is a belief and there's a sort of a grain in truth in all of these things, which is that the pain keeps us close to the person that died, that when you first most intensely feel it, you feel like you're honoring them and you're showing them, you know, you, how much agony that you're in. And that there is a kind of, I don't know if it's a battle, but there's a conflict. Like if I do let that go, I'm frightened I'm going to lose you, but also I'm some way abandoning you, that you're going to feel I don't love you anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and that's very confusing. Very confusing. And when I started Grief Gang, there was definitely an element of turn this pain into purpose to keep like your mum close to keep and to show like to put her on the pedestal to tell the world my mum and that still is true to this day but there was definitely an undercurrent of this will prove the love I have for my mum and knowing that that can only run for so long and I think that's potentially why as to why I've, I've gone for so long with grief gang and, and it's molded and changed because my my like objective of it and my purpose of it has changed from obviously I want to share my mum with the world and, and to continue her legacy and just to talk about her but it's changed I want to help people on a wider scale um, but the whole notion of turning pain into purpose it sounds very contradictory for even me to say it now but I think it can be quite damaging sometimes because you think I know definitely for me a little bit at times it was because you can you can run your whatever that looks like you know whatever you're doing to turn this pain into purpose you you run the risk of not letting your like person like die in vain and it's a good thing but when it's at, when that's the soul of what you're doing something for 
I do feel like that momentum will eventually wear off. You have to find that if there is a bigger purpose to this, what is the bigger purpose? And don't get me wrong, there are days when the, my purpose is I want to do this for my mum. I'd love to talk about my mum and our, our relationship and, and the grief of losing her. Um, but yeah, turning the big push, I feel like there is sometimes for grieving people a real big push um, from wider society to be like, do something in their name, do something in their legacy. And some people are like, I can love and grieve for my person quietly. Like, I don't have to go and create an Instagram account. I don't have to go and sign up to the London Marathon to do something for it. I can love and, and honour and respect my person um, very quietly and not be forced the hand of trying to create something purposeful out of this pain. Like, sometimes a tragedy is quite simply just a tragedy. Um, and we don't necessarily need to find, I don't want to say silver lining, but the purpose of what this is, finding like, the reason as to why we've been dealt this hand and have to create something. I think what you're saying, which I'm kind of very curious about and have thought a great deal about, is this incredibly complex navigation between turning your grief into purpose, which is also in some way a blocking of you feeling of the pain yeah, and that the pain is sitting there and you're kind of avoiding it. And so there isn't anything wrong in that per se. And also there is a, a risk that at some point that grief does need to be expressed because how we heal is by allowing ourselves to feel the pain. Mm. And also... I'm really applauding your recognition that we don't have to go on Facebook or Instagram or run a public marathon to show how much we feel in our loss, that grieving mm -hmm. up until really social media was a, an intensely mm -hmm. private, personal, intimate process. Yeah. And there is a real benefit in sharing and you've benefited many others and Others have benefited from each other through kind of these incredible communities. I suppose I'm curious, you know, you've brought this up, so I'm interested that for you, mm -hmm. you know, you're 25, you're working in the area of bereavement, you're hearing about deaths every day. Is there a cost to that for you engaging in a kind of innocent, fun, playful world, which... I would expect a 25-year-old to be doing. It's really interesting. And I think, you know, I've been doing Grief Gang for, it'll be four years this September. And so I started at 22. Yeah, 22. And this work, as you know, Julia, you've been for, for so many years, it's heavy. And... um. I never started Grief Gang with the intention for it to be the scale um, or have like the publicity to what it has today and for it to grow and have that many eyes. It very much started as just like a personal blog for me just to share quite literally those past three years in 2019, from 2016, 2019 to just brain dump all those that those feelings into this page it was a way of expressing yourself because therapy hadn't worked wasn't it it was yeah, because therapy, yeah, therapy hadn't, hadn't worked, worked for you and i want you to talk about that <laughs> yeah yeah yes yeah, so it was a way of there. yeah so yeah it was a way of expressing because yeah i in, in that summer of 2019 when i hit that brick wall of like oh well this grief is coming to say hello now um i, I tried the therapy route and I explored a few different avenues. It just wasn't sticking for me. And at the time, I want to say at the time there, because I don't think I was coming to therapy um, ready. Um, and with the potential, to what I'm going to say for me is all relative, the right attitude, I was still very quite angry. And so when I was met with quite um, hostile hostility from the therapist, I was ready to go at her as well. I'll say, fuck you too. Like, you're not for me either. And so I parked that there, and I, but I knew there was just something. Can I pause a moment? For me. And, yeah. Can I pause <laughs> you a moment and say, as the therapist, if I had an angry client, my response to them would not be angry. It would be, <laughs> yeah. what is the hurting beneath <laughs> your anger? And I'm also aware that you're a black woman, mm. and that idea of the sort of stereotype of the black angry yeah. woman 
kind of slightly sticks pins in in my throat. Yeah, and just even like even even me acknowledging that I wanted and needed to go to therapy, like in. I, I, I felt a bit of a stigma. I did. I did feel a bit of that stigma of kind of only people who go to therapy are really weak. And I have no problem in saying that that was my train of thought before. And through Grief Gang and through learning, I've absolutely unlearned that. But I remember, um, and I've said to you this before, about speaking to my dad and saying, oh, my mum was white and my dad is black, and saying to my dad, like, I think I need therapy. And, like, just saying to him, like, I don't feel okay. And... I, I didn't know what I was expecting, but he was like, I support you. I'm here for you. Let me help you. And so kind of the regular stereotypes and stigmas around the black community that like we don't go to therapy and that we, we view therapy as something that is only for like white community, you know, all those stereotypes there. It just really, it, it's not. And kind of, um, it was really comforting to have that support obviously from my only remaining parent and it being my dad. Um, and so even though therapy didn't work for me at the time, I'm so glad that I at least just dipped my toe into it and actually asked for help because I still do have a chip on my shoulder about asking for help. I'm, I do very much live with, if you want a job doing, do it yourself. And if you want to do, you know, you, you get out and you do it yourself and you go, um, you don't rely on anybody. And I definitely do think that has been heightened since losing my mum of, um, I don't have that safety net anymore of mum. Like I just don't have that fall back on like oh if it all goes Pete Tong and I've got nothing you know I can just rely on mum not you know like financially but you know mentally and emotionally like I don't have that safety anymore I must keep going forward and that's totally something to unpack like another day and I, I totally recognize that but yeah I, I, I went to therapy and it didn't work for me but I knew that I just had a feeling there just wasn't I knew that therapy didn't work for everybody else as well I knew I wasn't alone in this that I thought I'm not the only person in this bloody world who therapy hasn't worked for like surely and so yeah grief gang definitely became like a huge godsend for me and I just started meeting people but back to your question of is there a cost at being so young and doing this work I think yeah you know I'm 25 and I talk a lot about death and dying and I'm around death and dying and there are there were times definitely last year was a huge like catalyst year for me of learning boundaries and um when to say no and when to go this this has served me today and I do not need to push or exert myself anymore um but when you w grief gang for me was born out of desperation and when you have your desperate need met you're like I want more. I want to meet more people. I want to talk to more people. I want to learn more. And even though the topic is heavy and sometimes morbid and distressing, when when you've gone quite so long without it and you can still remember what that time was like without that support and that community, um, it's really hard to say no and put a boundary in place to something that you quite thoroughly enjoy. And that's what I really struggled with last year. I was so exhausted, both mentally and physically, with the work that I was doing. But I was enjoying the work that I was doing. And it was such a parallel because I'd never experienced that in life. I just, in previous, like, working jobs, day-to-day -day jobs, I'd be like, if I don't like it, I'm just going to leave. And But I actually enjoyed this work and it was tiring me. But there is, there is yeah, I think for anybody... Who, who is potentially listening, who is either, you know, on the online space or is young and thinking about coming into this work. I just think boundaries are so key because as much as talking about death and dying might fulfill you and, and provide you a purpose, you are of a young age and kind of you need to have the band to remember you're 25, go out and live your life and go out to the bar and dance with your friends. Like you don't have to sit and write all the emails and do all this stuff. Like it won't all fall apart. And, uh, Babes, like everyone is dying every single day. There's enough work for everybody. <laughs> it's enough for everybody. It's okay. And um, but then on the flip side too, being so young and in the work of death and dying and going through a bereavement so young, it's really taught me how to live. I think it's absolutely shown me how to live and how I really do want to live. And kind of, I do look at some of my peers in my friendship groups and afar, kind of who haven't experienced a bereavement. And kind of and what's it taught me? Gripes. It's it's taught me that 
nothing is an emergency. I don't know. I think that's the biggest thing. Like nothing is an emergency and that unless you work in the ER, nothing's an emergency and that it doesn't all fall apart and that, you know, you, not working till silly o'clock is absolutely fine and that you're you're exactly where you're meant to be. You're exactly where you're meant to be, Amber. And don't worry about it. What's for you will never miss you. And just to really, it's so obviously so cliche, but to really enjoy the times with those that you love. And I think definitely since starting Grief Gang and it just kind of taking off, I did lose a bit of sight of that. And actually realizing, why did you start Grief Gang, Amber? You started Grief Gang because your mum died and, you know, that absolutely sh- shook your world. And you look at those that you love differently, you hold them a bit tighter, you say yes to more plans with them rather than no just um it's 100 percent taught me how to live you realize how precious family you rush you recognize how precious family and people you love are and i was wondering with you in relation to you and your dad and your brother that they're both men grieving and you're a woman grieving and women and men tend to grieve differently how the three of you I think I want to know it presently, like I want to know in this minute, how the three of you are recalibrating your relationship given there's the space where your mum was. Yeah, it's currently, it's, you know, yeah, we're coming up seven years and that, that just feels like an, an insane amount of years, but then still feels so like yesterday. It's so strange. And a lot has changed in that time. Like my, my parents weren't together at the time of my mum's death and weren't for about a good five years before that. And we're now at a stage where my dad has a new long-term partner. And with that comes like its complexities and stuff like that. And things have changed in kind of conversations with my dad around mum, where I would perhaps enjoy, like, you know, my dad was married to my mum for 25 years and kind of he was the next closest thing I could ask about mum, like what I felt like. And kind of now there's this additional person in the space. It's a bit, a bit more, have to be a bit more calculated as to when I may ask those questions and kind of in fear of making someone uncomfortable or, you know, just kind of like that. So that's kind of where I'm at with dad. But I know that. But can if- I ask you something about, can I ask you something about your dad and your step? I don't know if she's your stepmom or his partner or whatever, but do you have a kind of very ambivalent feeling towards her that on the one hand you're pleased your dad has got someone to love him and kind of have a relationship and on the other hand you're kind of raging that she's taken your mum's place it's it's the yeah um, it's it's interesting this because <laughs> with my with my dad the rage is in, um, and I have, I have no problem saying there is rage, and it's been, it'll be approaching two years that they've been together, and this still, like I've said, rage is still a very comfortable feeling for me, but I just don't express it as much like I used to. But the rage isn't from like her filling in mum's space, the rage is in me feeling like she's taking away my dad and my only surviving parent, and it's oh. the the panic yeah the panic in that of but he's all I have left how dare you take him away from me he is my only parent and you've got him booked and busy every single week and I can't see him um but I but my logical mind knows that to not be and me me and my dad we have had conversations a very blaring conversations about this of he said, I'm, I'm, you, I'm your dad. I'm not going nowhere and no one will ever be in the space of that. But then reality kind of hits in day to day. So that's kind of where we're at. And there's a lot of rage and kind of unspoken things there. And it's something I do want to speak about on the podcast and explore more of like how navigating when the surviving parent moves moves on and finds a new partner Um because it's very complex. It's a big because, thing. Yeah, there, there is. And there is, there is parts of me that is like, I am happy for my dad to find love. And though him and my mum's marriage didn't work out, it's nice to see him happy. And it's almost like when I do kind of see him happy, I'm like, I get that little like, oh, that's nice. And to see him laugh and to smile. And then I'm like, no, suppress it. No, go away. 
<laughs> and I'm like, I'm, I'm honestly, you see the movies of like, you know, like the awful stepchild, like it kind of is like me. <laughs> and my dad's like, Amber, you're 25. Like, and I'm like, we, we, we've had arguments and conversations about it. And, and in his mind, he kind of thinks, but you're 25 and you've moved out of home. Like, why are you so worried and bothered about me? And like, like yearning for me and I'm a bit like I kind of am going back to like 19 year old Amber and if not before and being like but you're my daddy and you're my my only parent and like I need to know that when I when or if I need you you are going to be there and I know that to be true that he will always be there but just sometimes just that reassurance I think that's what it is and it's at a really unfamiliar place for me because I am not a woman who needs reassuring. I very much can reassure myself. But I guess when it comes to that parental role, I think I do. I need that reassurance. I think that's where I've lacked it from. You know, my mum was definitely more of my cheerleader of, you know, you're amazing. Put your mind to anything you want and you can do it. I have all the faith in you. And so like if you blow smoke up my ass, I'd be like, yeah, like I can go and do that. And whereas like my dad, he's definitely a bit more of a, he's, he's not, he's not um, reluctant on praise, but um, he's not as boastful as it, you know, like kind of really big things that have happened with Grief Gang and just telling him about it. And he's like, oh, well done. And it's like, oh, can you not just like get me a cake or something? Like get me something <laughs> to, <laughs> to celebrate. So I, mi- I, I miss that cheerleader. Yeah. And I, what it brings up for me, I think this will resonate with so many people what you're saying about the relationship with the other person and somehow being robbed of your surviving parent. And then it's the 19 year old Amber that panics because she knows a parent can die. And so it taps into that sense of kind of abandonment that I'm going to be left. Mm. And that's sort of in you. And so I really get that. And I also, uh, this is a tricky question which you may not want to answer. But did you have a a thought that you didn't want to have that you'd have preferred the other parent to die than your mum? Yeah, yeah. And I, that, that's 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 not a, that's not a, a, a nasty question to ask, and it's very honest because I think it's great that you asked that because I know that many people do have that feeling, and I would say absolutely in the last year since I moved out and left home. Um, I had that feeling a lot and that thought a lot of and thinking about what if it was the other way around you know mum would mum would never do this with like a new partner with us mum would talk to us more and have more open dialogue with us about things rather than just doing Um, mum wouldn't give up those certain traditions just because of a new partner all these things of well mum would it well mum well mum and that rage in my belly coming from there and going, yeah, well, what if it was the other way round? And it's, it is, I don't even want to sit and say like, it's a really ugly thing to think because I think that's um, being quite belittling and being a bit like, I don't know, gospel about it. Like, oh, if you think that you're an awful person, I know there's so many people that have thought, well, if it was my other parent, my other person, you you do think of what would life be? Um, it's a normal, kind of, healthy feeling, yeah, although it's an uncomfortable one. Yeah, yeah, and to kind of think, yeah, and think of God, yeah, if she was here, life would life even just in that respect, and other thing else would look so different. Like I wonder, would my niece and nephews even be just all these things? The butterfly effect, isn't it? And. It's yeah, it's taken me to a place and kind of there's there's conversations to be had with my dad about um parenting and parenting children who are grieving but are uh, you know are, are coming into adulthood and like my young adult my brother he's 32 33 this year with two children himself and kind of with my brother like where we my brother are today there are times where I will never forget there was a distinct time, very much, and it's a painful memory sometimes to go to of um, the day after our mum died. So um, where mum mum was found in her car outside a post office where she'd initially had her 
um, her heart attack and was found by a PCO officer. And they, she was left unconscious for a while and they took her to the hospital. Yeah. So that's what, that's essentially where, like we've said, she kind of died. She did die and then kind of revived her, but she was brain dead. And so the, the, it's outside a, a post office where, where near her work it was. So we kind of, I think the day after she died, the Sunday, went to lay some flowers near like the area where it was. And loads of friends and family came with us in, in support. And my brother hugged me. And we were hugging each other. I mean, my brother, we've got a seven year gap between us. We've lived very different stages of our life at different times. Like when he's been 18, I've been 11. And likewise, like we just moved through mm -hmm. life at very different stages. And um, he hugged me and he said, it's just you and me now. It's just you and me now. And I remember in that moment really going, oh, yeah, it is just you and me now. And I remember thinking... Oh, but what about dad? But then as years have gone by, feeling like, yeah, sometimes it is just me and him now who will always hold this gaping hole of the loss of mum in our lives. As much as dad and mum were married for 25 years and he grieves for her, it's a very, and they were separated at the time. It's a different grief. And, and now seeing how he has move forward with his life and his relationship and the things that have changed with it have kind of solidified that and it almost feels like me and my brother are still like standing at the pier and kind of watching and going like oh but like but our lives are still moving forward too like we're growing and growing around our grief too but it does feel like there is this separation that has has, has got involved now but with me and my brother, we've we've gotten better over the years. And as I've said to you before, like, you know, we really butted heads and grieved very, very differently from mum. His was very, you know, get your head down and do stuff. He did have a lot of responsibilities. He essentially became like owner of the family household. Um, within a year after mum, he found he was going to be a first time father. Like his life was just very, very constant. Um, with something to do, whereas my can I pause you? I I just have a, I just have a practical question. So, when your mum died, did you and your brother live in your mum's house, or you moved in with your dad? Yes. Yeah. No. So we, me, my mum, and my brother were living in the same household, and my dad was had moved, had left the family home. So now, essentially, under this one household was just me and my brother. Um, there was a question uh, of course. my. Yeah, there was a question of my dad coming back into the household and he offered to move back in. But we said, we've already gone through so much change. Our mum has just died. And then having our father, who's not lived under our roof for five years, come back, like, that's just even more strange. So we were like, let's just see it's how we can weird. get by. Yeah, it's just too weird, too much weird stuff. So we're like, let's just see how we get by. And we did. My brother and his partner moved in and, and we kind of were living under there as a three and that had its own challenges as well. Just There was just so much grief in this household and it just stunk of us. The only way I ever describe it, the house just stunk of her and it just reeked and I wanted to be everywhere but home. So I went back to work the Thursday after she died. So that was less about five days. I went back to work okay. very quickly and I look back and I think... I still don't know if it was a good thing or a bad thing, but at the time it felt really great and it was quite nice to go to work and to be, I, I just started this job as well. So no one really knew me from Adam. Um, I, was, I was in my first week of like probation. I remember it was so fresh. And so no one, everyone just knew me as the new girl Amber. No one knew me as new girl Amber, dead mum. And I could choose whether people knew that. So I remember I took the five days off and kind of it was a, enough time for people to question where I'd been, but not really enough. I remember one particular girl who was on my, it was like shadowing me in this work and uh, I shadowed her. She said, oh, where have you been? You've been away. And I so bluntly, I must have looked like dead behind the eyes, turned around and said, oh, my mum died on Saturday. <laughs> and she looked mortified. <laughs> mm. It was so. But you know, bad, I, but yeah, I, uh, I, it, I, I think your default response of going back to work and living, you know, in that oscillation between loss orientation, restoration orientation, 
probably was your most useful survival mechanism. That if you'd stayed at home in the house that was stinking and reeking of your mum and not working at all, you would have had no part of you that knew how to live. Because at least going to work, it gave you the structure. Okay, I'm learning in my probation, but this is a work version, Amber, that I can put not much aside, but in a, mm. I can put her slightly to the back of my mind, put on a show. And I actually think that's really helpful. Yep. It probably was the best thing it you was. could have done, actually. Yeah, it was. And it's like, it's really, I think definitely uh, over the years, I've def- I've been challenged so much on, on interviews and just people sharing. They just, the jaw drops on the floor. They're like, oh my God, five days. And it had, it definitely made me think like, oh God. And again, it fed, oh my God, do I not love my mum? Did I not love my mum enough that I didn't take off six months bereavement leave? But the logistics of it was, Julia, I was like, I need money. I need to work. It wasn't even mm-hmm. a thing of like, uh, you know, there was elements of, oh, I don't want to be at home. But the nuts and bolts was, I was 19. I'd just like passed my drive. You had no money. I had a car. I was like, I've got, to pay. I've got to pay for a fucking car. I've got to get to work. I want to, I've got to live. I've got, my, I've got my friend's birthday next week. What am I going to do? Life. And that was, that is definitely something I got from my mum. Mum went through so much shit in her life from, from birth to, to death. She went through a lot. Did she was like, the show keeps fucking going, guys. The show keeps going. I'd see my mum cry at things and she'd cry. She'd crumble to the floor. She would let herself crumble and she'd get up and she'd go, right, what's the plan then? What are we doing? And I would be like, oh my God, this woman, she's like, she's not, I remember thinking she's not mentally okay. But actually the show kept going because I think for her, she felt, well, oh, I've got no safety net. I've got no safety net either. I can't let this crumble. I can't lose my home for my children. I have to put food on the table. Keep calm and carry on. Well, I... I think in our culture now, it's changing in the awareness of of mental health and what support that we need. It has amped up the need to let yourself really feel all of the difficult things that you're feeling and name your your kind of mental state. And, And I applaud that. But what I don't encourage is that you lose the capacity to keep calm and carry on too. I think we need both. Yeah. I think we need an aspect of ourselves that gets the pay, bills paid, that does exactly what your mum does, falls on the floor, cries, says yeah. it's awful, really wails, yeah. and then gets up and cooks the dinner. And we do that in and out. Because I think if you stay on the floor, you feed yourself with the misery and then it's mm-hmm. really hard to get up from the floor. So hard. And I am really grateful that, you know, I kind of, le- there was times when, you know, the, sort of the way my mum navigated through life and, you know, she wasn't the best at expressing her emotions. And she, again, she was very much more comfortable with anger than she was upset. And so she wasn't the best at saying, yeah, like, I'm really upset. I'm, 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 I'm struggling, whatever it may be. And I respect her for, you know, for the, like, the last kind of seven years of her life, she became a single mother, dad supported, but a single mother. She'd been through a lot with her own family, you know, with, you know, to do with race and, and marrying a black man. And all this comes out when people die as well, which is fascinating to me. All the family secrets come out then. And um, I oh, I applaud her. Where? I thank her. For, I know. <laughs> yeah, they all come out then. Um, but so you didn't um, know about that that they were against her marrying a black man. No, I didn't, and that, and and you know, I I don't speak with my mum's a, a portion of my mum's side of the family because only because of that, you know. And um, there was many, you know, she she mum married or was with dad very early in the nineties, late eighties, early nineties, and mum came from a very small seaside town of Great Yarmouth. And, um, you know, it's very questionable and just they moved very quickly. Within a year, mum was pregnant with my brother and was moving down south to be with dad and, and to be as a family. And then, yes, yeah, seven years go by because of this and being unhappy about this relationship. Um, seven years, which is the time between me and my brother. And then I'm born. And I think there was a bit of a conversation of, 
to my father because my mum, my mum's mother died in childbirth. Um, so my mum never knew her mum. Oh gosh! So oh she goodness. was raised. Yeah. So she, 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 she. I could write a book about my mum and kind of her, her life and mm. what she'd been through. And so, yeah, she was, my mum was raised by her mum's sisters and, and her nannies and grandmothers. So she was very much a, a powerful woman surrounded by powerful women too and raised by them. Um, and her father, he he moved on and, and had a new wife and had her two sisters. But yeah, in that after that seven years, I was born and kind of there, I think there was a bit of a conversation of your daughter is having family and you're missing out and kind of a bit of a nudge. And um yeah, so kind of, yeah, that whole complexities of after she died of discovering things about a part of a side of a family that, you know, you kind of, I, w- I looked to this side of the family for real comfort after she died and I wasn't getting it. I felt that at times I had to be the adult um, and that was really interesting of kind of going through a bereavement so young and I be, me being the youngest of the whole family um, and wanting to crumble, but actually looking around me and looking at the elders in my life and looking at them and going, oh, no, actually, I can't crumble because you're a mess. And actually, I need to comfort you because you're the one who's on the floor and I need to pick you up. So I definitely kept calm and carried on for quite a long while. And like you, I agree. I think that I think to have an element and still a part of you that can let yourself crumble and go to you know the depths of that pain and go wipe mm. those tears and go enough's enough now i need to do what i need to do to survive still because mm. when i just I, I i i never did have really kind of a phase of where i crumbled and was like i'm not going to come out of this like i don't know i always knew well there is an end date to this because i can't simply cry my life away um, I do have to go to my job. I do have to spend time with my partner. I would like to. I would like to laugh again. I, do you know what? I actually do like laughing, so I would like to laugh again at some You're point. You're good at laughing. Um, yeah, and I love a good laugh. I love to make people laugh. I love. To, I love a good yeah. many laugh. D- laughter to me has been my medicine. Whether it's actually even laughing at my grief and the shit show of it is, or just actually like seeking out that joy in life. I love it. I love to live. I love to laugh. I love to love, um, and so it, yeah. Keep You're good at all of that. Carrying on, and you got that from your mum, and you got your anger from your mum, and you you got a lot from your mum. <laughs> but also, I mean, we can't go into it now. But it sounds like the complexity of what she was living with, of the racism in her family, that kind of has le- a legacy left in your relationship with them, and how they feel now that she's died, given that they. Mm were against her or there was some kind of estrangement. Yeah. I suppose what, I, what I'm wondering about is, is there some of that that's in you that needs to be unpacked? That's, you know, that, and what's hers and what's yours in relation mm-hmm. to them? It's so, it's so interesting and it's a part of my grief that kind of once I closed the door in it, I said that's enough now um and never really went back to it because my mum my mum forgave my mum did forgive it wasn't when she died they were still estranged they were we were oh, good, I only knew goodness. about this yeah so I only knew about this estrangement after she died so this is yeah 1990 to 97 and I was like oh my god how are you hearing about this now but then as I kind of looked back across my whole lifespan and the relationship that we had with this 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 side of the family it was very distant and it all started to make sense a bit you know I didn't call my mum's father granddad because I actually didn't know he was my granddad because my mum would call him by his name she wouldn't say dad she'd say his name and so I called his name too and then I know and then only years later (laughs) when I got a little bit older I realized oh actually he's my grandfather but that was not a grandfather and granddaughter relationship. And um, so when she died and then I discovered this news and it kind of, there was always an internal feeling in me of like, we're family, but we're not really family. We're not close. Mm. And like, we weren't, we weren't close. I was a lot closer with other people in my mum's family. And um, learning the, what she went through and what they actually put her through, I 
almost took on this new baggage, like this un this this is re the really new fight. Resolved, quote, exactly. Baggage. Yet the new fight, I I created like a new fight, and at times I questioned. I was like, am I just digging up old wounds? But I felt like it was an old wound that, like, oh, it was really strange to say because their attitude at the time of mum's death was not great. So I was like, I could actually respect if things previously before and mistakes were made and we could learn from it. But there were some questionable things after she died and even on the day of her funeral about, you know, comments about people who had travelled to come to her funeral and making remarks of, oh, there's a lot of brown people here today. And I'll never forget that particular oh, family member saying that. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't hear it, but it was one. It was my, so one side of my a, a closer family member on my mum's side Jesus. heard one of the family members on the no, no longer speaking family side say that, and they said, "Yeah, no brown people here today." And um, this family member turned around and was like, "Yeah, people who loved her, you know, what does it matter?" Yeah. And yeah, it was in that so moment good. Okay, that I realised, yeah, and that I realised that they've not changed and they're not going to change. And actually, I'm a lot unhappier with them in my life than I am with them. And that yeah. was really hard to do because I all I I've never really struggled with. I, I there have been times where I wanted to ask my mum things of like, am I doing the right thing? Like. I very much, I don't, I, I don't live with like an internal monologue of my mum. I used to of like, what would mum do? But I, I very much stepped into my own womanhood and my own being in the last couple of years and knowing that she's taught me enough to know, to know what's right and what's wrong. But around that time when I was cutting ties off with this part of her family, there was like a whole new grief with that because I was yes. purposefully cutting off these people who one were part of her DNA, um, and who have like who are like the gatekeepers to memories of her. To her memories. But I yeah, the... to, yeah, I I had to make the conscious decision to go. I actually have to let that part die. Like I have to let that go because you caused me so much pain and angst and anguish in my life that I'm actually more at peace with letting that part and that chapter of my mum go then have you in my life. You are too toxic for me. You do not make me feel good. And that was really, really hard. But over the years, I I questioned, I questioned that that decision and that choice. But penultimately, it's been the best decision I ever made. Um, and I connect and, and keep the memories through other members of the family. Oh, Amber, that is such a... A kind of, but as your mum died, there was so many other multiple losses and complexities mm -hmm. that were kind of linked to her and her relationship with her family that you then had to grieve and end. And I'm really kind of proud of you, I guess, for making such a tough decision and mm -hmm. that you're so clear that it was such a good decision. Yeah. I can't believe we've come to the end of our yeah. conversation. There's so much that we haven't spoken about Amber I want to kind of talk forever I know I, I wondered if you I wondered if you had a question for me oh my question for you Julia um what would I think back to the question you asked me of you know how being 25 and doing this work how to look after you know kind of what how what's the ben other you know, the benefits and the negatives of it what would what would you say for someone like me who who is in this work? And I do feel like there's like an air of, you know, whether it's too much to say, like, you do give me, you know, you're a mum, you're a mum of, of four, right? And like you do give me this air of mum. And like when I was with you and yeah. Emily that day, and kind of you do, and you just, you know, when you say like, oh, hello, Angel, like you do, you give that mum energy and it's so comforting. So like when you do say, to, when we did that event that day, you said you were like, what are you doing to look after yourself? Like, where's your supervision? Mm. And I was like, oh, I don't know. It felt so nice to be like, look cared for then. 
But what would yes. your advice be for someone like me and anyone else who is quite young and looking to get into bereavement work and whatever that looks like to like look after themselves? I mean, I think that is a a good question. And I do feel maternal towards you. I feel a real fondness <laughs> and warmth for you, Amber. And and also I was aware that I was a mum to my daughter in front of you when you were talking about your mum's death and that there was a, a, you know, a real missing in that for you. And yet somehow you were able to be with us. It didn't trigger you, which I, mm. I was curious about. Mm. I think, yeah. I, I mean, I think you said a lot of the things is recognizing that you have a good no and that you have boundaries because there is a, and I know this from my own experience, it is very addictive being wanted and being needed because you feel powerful and grief is often about feeling powerless. And so it gives you a sense of like, I can change the world and then it can use up all your emotional energy. And so I think it's important to have boundaries and to have a, which means having a good no. I think it's important to have supervision and a, and a kind of place where you debrief so you can put stuff down. And with you and with other people listening who it's a lot of their life, I would be curious as to the point in your life where it can be a smaller part of your life so that it, you will keep it going, but that you grow and expand parts that aren't to do with death and dying. You know, I, I want to see you having a sex and fun and laughter <laughs> and partying and getting out there and being silly. And, you know, and if you spend all day talking to people who are grieving, it's hard to switch in the evening. Yeah, um, I think... The thing I'll leave you with is how you spend your day is how you spend your life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you want to be spending your whole life in the bereavement world? And, and this is someone who I have spent my whole life. So I started yeah. in my 30s. But I think there's a difference. And maybe mm. it, it isn't a real difference. But I think there's a difference being in your 20s and doing it and in your 30s. Totally. Yeah, I think so. That's great. No, that is. That definitely, I think it's definitely tapping into something that I already knew. I've already made the intention this year for myself of less work, more living and more spending time with the living. Um, nice. I love who are living. Yeah. And kind of, I had a bit of a wobble at the end of last year talking to my best friend and I was like, I feel like I've been a really shit friend to you this year. Mm. Like, I just felt like I wasn't showing up in a way that for the people that I loved in a way that I would be proud of. And that's been a real kind of motivator for me this year to be like, I don't want to feel like that at the end of um, last year, at the end of this year. I want to look back and see and go, look at the memories I made both career wise and with friends and family it doesn't have to be one or the other I can have both if I want to well I mean I think that's fantastic wisdom isn't it that you're putting a lot of life in your life mm. and you want to build experiences in your memory that are lively experiences so that when you look back at your life you've got those fun experiences and also yeah. that your friendships really matter and they need time. They need Definitely. space to evolve and, and feel close. Yeah. And so that's, and I guess that is also the legacy of your mum, that she taught you mm. that people really in the end matter more than anything. And oh, yeah. the people that are living, you need to invest in as well as yeah. your mum. Totally. Totally. Do you have a last word of wisdom that you want the listeners to know and also where they can Ooh. find you oh my gosh a last words of wisdom what I was going to say at the end of there maybe a bit of wisdom to kind of think about you know if you've been through bereavement and or just you know kind of maybe like me you work a bit too much you're in the space and you're doing a lot of work and you kind of everyday worries I often think about deathbed amber <laughs> I always think you know if I'm if yeah, I, and then I don't think that like I'm dying, <laughs> but I often think of when I'm in a real rut 
of like work or you know podcasting because that can be stressful as we know and just if I'm just really getting a bit down in the dumps about overwhelmness I just go what would deathbed amber actually remember of this (laughs) will deathbed amber will she remember oh my god you didn't put the podcast out on time in january 2021 she won't fucking remember a fucking thing of me (laughs) um no doesn't um, fucking matter amber (laughs) what deathbed amber will remember is that holiday she said yes to with her girlfriend that time that birthday with her nephew where she wasn't texting and writing emails where she was playing nerf guns with him These are the things she will remember and that she gives a shit about. Of course, there is time and place to sit down and write the email and to work hard for what you want. But know when, or you know what, fling the phone, shut the laptop, let let this, let let joy in. And like, especially when you're grieving and you've been through such a loss, know when to you know let that joy in so often i hear people especially in the immediacy after a death of like i don't think i deserve to be happy i don't deserve joy and i challenge that and i say you of all deserve the joy if any kind of person in this world deserves it it is you you have been in the storm and the rain and the just awfulness of it like step into the sunshine you deserve it that's a lovely way to end amber and people can find you on grief gang podcast grief gang yep. instagram find me yeah on any and major platforms and yeah i'm there season five coming in march thank you so much for having me good for you amber thank you amber so much that was a really beautiful conversation it means a lot to me that you've joined us Thank you. Hi, Emily and Sophie. We are going to talk about Amber Jeffrey and this really illuminating conversation about her mum dying and being a young person with a mum dying um, and kind of wondering what your what your initial thoughts are. Um, well, first of all, I find Amber just such a pleasure to listen to. Um, I think she mentioned I do... I met her and know her a little bit and it's always a joy to hear her um but what really stood out for me initially was the kind of before and after of death that you're sort of just living your life and suddenly at age 19 she was suddenly catapulted into this brand new world and nothing is the same again and so to me it felt like she didn't just lose her mum she also lost her childhood because at 19 actually you're not really ready for for the world in lots and lots of ways and you still need parenting most 19 year olds still need some form of parenting in some ways and yet she didn't get that because when she lost her mum she also lost the person who was like head of her household her primary caregiver and it made me just think about this domino effect of loss that often when somebody we love dies we lose them but we often also lose all sorts of things that go with them, like the safety that they provide, whether that's emotional, whether that's physical, whether that's a combination, and the kind of knock-on effect of that. Mm. And this sort of long journey of adaptation to such a sort of profound loss, isn't it? Because it's not just, as you say, the loss of the person. It's a loss of an imagined future. It's a loss of who you are as an identity, like I think often with clients, it's quite a long journey to find out who they are again after having had that experience. You know, she talked about for a long time being a really angry person and then rediscovering that she's not actually a really angry person. And it's you reconfigure and change, and that's a very in that process where there's a lot of um, change going on in the, while you're in the throes of grief. It's really unsettling because you often don't know how you're going to react to things or who you are. So there's all these different levels that it makes that makes it challenging, particularly with a sudden loss like hers. One of the things I thought she was very brave, and I think people listening um, can resonate with, is you know the wrong parent died, 
And sometimes it's even the wrong child died. You know, my favorite child died or the wrong grandparent died. I didn't really care about that one, but I, I wanted him to die or her to die. And there's a lot of kind of... Um, is it what is it? Shame. Shame. I was going to say shame or taboo. It's, it's really taboo. Really, I think it's, it's really taboo. Taboo, and it's complex, and it's incredibly courageous to sort of speak the unspeakable. Yeah, in the hand because it does feel like I'm not supposed to think that I'm not supposed to feel that, and yet it's an incredibly natural thing to think and feel, and there isn't a right or a wrong. <laughs> It it just is. It just is, to a certain extent. But it. But I think it takes a lot to be able to say it. And I think you know Amber has a lot of clarity in that. But I think it's very relatable. And that by naming our most taboo things or shameful things, we then open them up to the possibility of relating to them differently. When we are ashamed and we lock them in a sort of secret lockbox because we're afraid if we look at them or heaven forbid anybody else looked at them that would be the end or we're unlovable for having them then they they get stuck and frozen as not only that thought or feeling but our way of thinking and relating to that thought or feeling and it becomes like part of us we become bad and shaped around it you know Um, whereas if you allow it to be voiced, then it can transition. Even if the thought or feeling doesn't change itself, how we feel about that thought or feeling can change. And, and that we are all multitudes. So that that thought or that feeling that feels completely taboo and that we shouldn't have it and it's not allowed is very rarely the whole of what we think and we feel. And I think giving us permission giving ourselves permission to think and feel whatever that taboo thing is, whether it's related to death, whatever, relationships, I think all sorts of things we can feel like, oh, I'm not supposed to think that. But I think allowing ourselves to feel it and think it and even say it, (laughs) um, then that gives you more space to allow the other parts of yourself as well. I also thought it was helpful to hear about uh, someone who's responded through real anger in grief because we often hear more stories of sadness. And actually, it's really such a, such a common response to feel really angry, angry with possibly with the person who died, angry with what happened, and... Angry with other people around. Angry with other people around. And the anger for some people is a really powerful place or a good defended place to live when things feel unbearable. Or in her case, as she described, it was survival. Like, a new reference to Emma, when you're younger... In her case, 19, it's like, I didn't have a lot of choice. I needed to get on. I needed to have a job. I needed to have life. And and anger can feel like energy in the tank um, when there isn't any other energy in the tank because what's there is mostly sadness. Yes, and I think it also was very interesting to me, this idea of our default emotions, the emotions that are comfortable for us Mm -hmm. and that this is not just about bereavement, but I think in general, we all have emotions that feel like this is a safe and acceptable emotion and it usually comes from emotions that were safe and acceptable for you when you were a child as you were growing up so it might sound like an Amber's family anger was like the default emotion it was okay to feel angry and get angry and be explosive whereas in other families it might be being sad is okay being sad is acceptable you're not supposed to be angry that's like a bad icky emotion we're, think, we're not very good at being angry. Right. I, not that I was thinking about us. That's what all <laughs> yes, the Samuel family, I would say anger is... Led by your mother who isn't comfortable with anger. <laughs> yes, so we're lots of good reasons. We're lots of good working on it. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I think it's actually quite a helpful exercise. I think I've talked about this before. To write down the five core emotions of anger, sadness, fear, joy, disgust... You can draw a circle, and if you think about when you were a child as you were growing up, the emotions that were acceptable, and you write those in the circle, and then outside of the circle, write the ones that were not acceptable, that felt like you are not, I'm not supposed to feel this. And then sometimes there are emotions that were sometimes allowed and sometimes not allowed, and write those on the line. And I think it's just quite a nice 
visual way of thinking about your relationship to different emotions and are there actually emotions in yourself that you're still not allowing yourself to feel because they're too frightening because you were told that you're not really supposed to feel those things um and I think a lot of sort of yeah dangerous yeah and I think a lot of parenting advice now is focused on validating all of your children's emotions allowing them to feel the full spectrum even if you don't validate the behavior I also was very interested in Amber talking about therapy not being for her (laughs) because I think therapy isn't for everyone I imagine that if you're someone listening to this podcast you might be (laughs) interested in therapy given that it's called therapy works but I do think it's really helpful to know that there are other ways of finding your way through grief and obviously what she does which is kind of creating community I think is such a important resource that people can use if they feel like therapy isn't the right place for them um there are also um death cafes which are um free drop-in places that are all over the country and I actually think they're international as well and it's this just get together essentially yes community where you can just drop in I think there's tea cake and people Starbucks or mm. where and people talk about death and it doesn't mean that you have got to have just experienced a death or you know actually being anywhere in a kind of bereavement experience it's just for people who are interested in death and want to talk about it and share experiences and I think it really did Amber talking really made me think about there are actually all these other different ways that we can support ourselves that don't involve therapy Yes, and you saying that also makes me think about that therapy, sort of historically, is traditionally very culturally very white and Eurocentric or Western in its sort of ways of being and its sort of cultural norms about how we behave in therapy. And I was listening to a podcast the other day about a a Latino woman and a black woman therapist who set up a group for parents, for women, and how they found themselves just adapting all the norms. So suddenly there was lots of contact and there was hugs and there was the the timing was kind of got more fluid and there was lots of food and that made those communities feel that's much more for the groups they were saying, that was much more intuitive and natural and put them at ease. Whereas it's quite um sort rigid of white, boundaries. white rigid boundaries and we don't touch each other and everything's very precise and we're on time that that culturally made them feel uncomfortable, like they didn't belong. Um, and that may be certain formats that, or cultures or communities that fit your grief more, more is a better fit. Um, or finding a therapist who's possibly from the same uh, minority as you can also sometimes be helpful and you can feel better understood. I was just going to say, I think there's a huge amount of research on minorities and their engagement in mental health care and access to it. And then not just access to it, but also a lot of um, research into minorities who do access it, that their sort of consistent engagement in it, so their repeat going back to get treatment is just infinitely lower than white communities. And I think it's exactly that. about thinking about what works for different people. Um, And when I worked at Yale, I was actually um, part of a um, research group called Mamba. And it was about providing access to um, people who don't genuinely engage in mental health care. In this particular instance, it was mothers with um, high risk mothers with um, postnatal depression and their idea was to make it much more easy to um, engage in mental health care. And they did that in all sorts of different ways. So, for example, they provided childcare, they provided money for a bus ticket to be able to get to the place, and they also provided support in places that people automatically already go. So they would have a mental health provider in your local supermarket in hair salons in nail salons and so having it 
a place that isn't so formal and like maybe inaccessible and maybe somewhere that they've had a really negative experience in the past and just trying to kind of break down Meet people where they are and break down the, the barriers that prevent people from engaging yes and that they, we can't um escape the fact that the history of racial violence of um our, means that if you're a white professional and you're working with a person of color that's in the room and um well that's in a group or in a one-to-one of therapy and that uh that somehow needs to be acknowledged it does and ha- and that that not to be can make it in a much more unsafe space for someone who this even if they haven't had a specific negative experience with mental health they may much might have had a negative experience of establishment of people in power of white people so one of the things i say is you know as we sit opposite each other we bring our histories with us and we have very different histories and um mine is a white privileged history and i ask them how they define theirs and what it brings and we look at where they might clash or acknowledge what I might misunderstand and then open the door for them to be able to tell me, no, you don't get this, you're not understanding me, or I've made assumptions, or, um, and so I think just naming it is really helpful. The, the last thing I wanted to kind of look at um, for people listening is that often pre-existing fault lines in families are the kind of places where relationships can um, go asunder, you know, where there's already been difficulty, where there is then a, a sudden and unexpected death. Families don't tend to get closer. The, the, the fractures tend to get worse because what caused them in the first place, the behaviours, the judgement, the um, blaming, the <clears throat> tends to be the thing that sort of pervades again in a family and I don't know if you had ideas of what would protect families against that honesty I think the thing of secrets coming out after somebody has died can be very very destructive because there's no way of addressing them with the person who's died so I think often we don't tell our children things because we want to protect them but most times children and you know adult children (laughs) need at least a version of the truth that is age appropriate if you've got younger children but I think or sometimes what happens after somebody's died is all these things come out that weren't known about when the person was alive and I think that can be really damaging and difficult to repair I think also having a tolerance for other people holding a different narrative for you to you that if you are engaging in these conversations where you speak your versions of your experience and allow yourself to hear them without there needing to be a right version that you can all live with your different stories and that can be okay that you don't need to agree who was to blame for this or you know that all your stories don't need to line up. I think it's helpful to be able to talk your stories and be heard respectfully and to hear other people's stories respectfully so that you can, at least in the beginning, just coexist, even if you can't be close. Right. And then and then I think also when you need to, like Amber needed to, if, you know, end relationships. If they're, if they're toxic and harmful and just, you know, giving you a lot of distress, I think, Knowing Holding when to pretend to yourself mm-hmm. is also very hard, but really important. Yeah. There's one last thing I was going to say, which is quite a different topic. It was at the end, you were talking with Amber about um, her being in grief so young and so early and wanting her to have fun and fun and, and like all of that. <laughs> and then I thought, well, that's funny, isn't it? Because two things I thought. One, I think both me and Emily have been in this game, in one version or another, since we left university. Uh, Pretty much. In our in early early twenties, I think I did my first training when I was twenty one, twenty. Um, and it doesn't feel to me like I've lived in a heavy world as a result necessarily. And that I was thinking, you know, the twenties can be quite a misunderstood era. 
Like there can be this mum's ex- expectation that it should be like full of sex and fun and parties. And that's why that's why I want people to have. But I was married with four kids. And I know. That's, yeah. well, that's what I say. I'm like, I'm not sure that is. It's often a really transitional, difficult time. You're becoming an adult for the first time. You don't know what you're doing. You're trying to find your identity. And sure, you might be having more relationships and things are more fluid in that phase and maybe in other phases of life potentially. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? I don't think I necessarily think of the 20s as like, that's when you get to have fun. I think I loved Amber's response, which was, I just say to myself, I am where I'm supposed to be. Mm. And I think that is such a insightful and wise you know way of looking at it that Mm -hmm. who knows what will happen in the future for any of us but we are where we're supposed to be Um, and maybe my response in a kind of Jungian sense was that what I want for her is what I want yeah (laughs) (laughs) you wanted to do more sets of parting where you had four children (laughs) exactly Lisa had sex four times (laughs) Uh, we do not want to talk about your sex life we are still your children (laughs) true I don't want to talk about it either it's just it's kind of being funny and not funny (laughs) So lovely, Amber. Thank you so much for your kind of courage and honesty and insight, I think. And your swearing. And your swearing. <laughs> you received the prize for the most swearing on our podcast. <laughs> Did she? That's good. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Uh, maybe we should have a prize at the end of every uh, yeah. season. <laughs> um, I say thank you, lovely Amber. And thank you, Emily and Sophie. And thank you, everyone listening. And do share it with people that you think will find it useful or helpful or funny. And also do please um, raise it and subscribe and review the podcast so more people can find it and listen to us. Um, Until next week, thank you. Bye-bye.